I'm opening. We have an eye, sort of a nostril, two teeth. Hmm. One of the teeth has a small cavity. Close call, folks, but I think we got here just in time. Presented by Maria Menounos and Kevin Undergaro. This is Anatomy of a Movie. In-depth discussions and breakdowns of various movie titles. And now that you've seen the movie, let the dissection begin. Hi, guys. We're here for another episode of Anatomy of a Movie. I'm Sarah Stratton, and today we have a very special guest, the wonderful Ryan McGarry, or Dr. Ryan McGarry. Is that how I should say it? Hey, I'm off duty, so... So no, so just Ryan. Not. Definitely not. It's off duty time. Okay. And so yeah, Ryan works. We have to tell everyone why you're here. We're here to talk about a wonderful documentary. It's called Code Black. It's coming to theaters soon, and I just got to see it last week. I like want to say that I really like it because I do, but it also was a little bit scarring. Um, I'm not good with like real life gore. I can watch 300 like a thousand times and yes. be totally fine and like it goes straight over my head. Watching this, knowing is real, you like push the boundaries of what you were willing to show to the camera. I was a little taken back at points. Was that a goal? Were you like, were you like, I'm putting everything out there? I want to see. I mean, it, it was people. a goal. It wasn't a gratuitous goal. Mm -hmm. like, we had meaning behind it. So, I mean, mm -hmm. yes, it's extraordinarily graphic at times. But I think what we wanted you to feel, which is exactly how I felt just a few years ago when, you know, I was there and someone was like, hey, see this, uh, see this gunshot wound in this guy's chest? What's your plan, buddy? What's your plan? You got to fix this. And you're going... You know, I think I know what to do, but I don't know, and like, and and that's terrifying. So we do, we want you in the movie to feel that with us, us being myself and my physician friends, and um, you know, we're young docs at this point. Mm -hmm. Like, we we're not experienced. We're not like battle ready. We don't we don't know all of the ins and outs of is how to fix this thing. So yeah, we want you to feel um, that intensity. When you're entering into the situation, so at the beginning, Code Black, you're going through your residency. We follow you through four years. And we kind of see it go step by step. There's a lot of transitions between hospitals, between like the learning curve. But getting in that first day, that first week, like what have you learned up to then? Like have you worked with patients in critical condition before? Or is this on your feet the moment you're entering LA County, that's your first ER experience? Well, let's just say that there's that there's like normal medicine and then there's county medicine, okay? okay. And 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 you you can't be ready for county medicine. I mean, county county medicine is a is a crossroads between some of the sickest people in the city because they don't have any they don't have any coverage, so they wait till they're at death's doorstep to even show up. So you're pulling people in from the waiting room mm -hmm. who are literally dying right there, and then you got the five and the ten freeway and the sixty all converging, and you got car wrecks, and then you got a lot of gang territory in that area. Who, thankfully, le less um, now than then, they're, they're shooting and stabbing each other. So all that's converging on one place, and uh, who can be ready for that, right? So, you, so up until then, yeah, you're a little bit prepared. You studied some things, but you can't be ready to to be thrown into that craziness. I'm just fascinated because obviously, like, yes, you can't be prepared for that. It's crazy. But then you decided on top of that you were going to start a film and start the endeavor of creating a visual representation of this. Like, what made you think you were prepared to do that? It turned out very well. You did a very good job. But what gave you the idea that sparked turning your experience into a film? Well, for one, I read Maria's book right here. Because <laughs> every girl's guide to diet and fitness is going I to tell prepared. you about. I read this thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Maria. You read this four Listen, years ago before book. it was I read published? this book. I was ready. Not only was I ready for uh, trauma surgery, uh, critical care medicine, but I was also ready to make a film. All from this there book. You Maria, you rock. And you obviously know how to time travel because this is brand new and that happened, what, a couple of years ago now? Listen, that's neither here nor there. Okay. <laughs> but thank you. It is a very good bo yeah. book. Guys, check it out. Yeah, for real. So um, basically, what was your question? Sorry. I want to know what made <laughs> yeah. you decide to start filming this. Like, where did that inspiration come from? Uh, okay, honestly, when I arrived at uh, the LA County Hospital, mm -hmm. I was a medical student. So mm -hmm. that's like pretty low on the totem pole. Um, I think in that moment, uh, you know, you think you've seen some things, you've, you've read about some stuff, and, and I... I still had the perspective to know that what was going on there was completely extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And on top of things, there was about to be a big change. So this was a 80-year hospital that had mm -hmm. kind of fit their emergency department in just the ground floor. It wasn't even its own dedicated area. I mean, it had become that over the years. But, I mean, emergency medicine is only 30 years old. 
So mm -hmm. this was like sort of a new, just a whole new place. And um, I found out that they're about to move hospitals. So they're going to go from the old hospital to the new one. And at that point, I was like, wow, this would be an incredible place to um, like shoot a film and, and like document this. And um, yeah, and, and on top of that, the visual nature of the space was, as a filmmaker, was absolutely incredible. And I thought, all right, I will, I will archive, like we'll do, we'll shoot some archival footage and we'll see where this goes. And that kind of took off from there. Oh, so this was originally just to document the move. Because to right. me, one of the messages of this film, it does show the change, but it also is this, it's like peeling back the layers of this onion of all the problems in the medical industry. Right. And that's a much, in a way, deeper level that this film connects to. Exactly. It does illustrate yeah. how hard it is, and you kind of divide it into these sections throughout the film. And it's just, I feel like I'm just getting the beginning of all of the complicated matters that go in between you know, papers and the, the patients themselves and right. the healthcare and the government and shortages on doctors and nurses. There's so many things. That was, was that was all a second kind of... Yeah, well, so the, so, I mean, listen, documentary film is mm -hmm. br brutally hard for the reason that you don't, you don't know your story until you're doing it. And that's terrifying, right? Because like, you, ideally you're telling a story, you want to script it out. You want to have a, a set outline and you're like, all right, you, there's some safety in that because you know here's what's going to happen. Uh, documentary is quite a leap. I mean, I, I think I set out absolutely to capture this historic move from this one historic location to another all in the context of this like visual insanity of these crazy sick people and, and the intensity of this world in and this everything tiny else. room. Exactly. Um, that, of course, changed uh, when I became a training physician there myself. So that's a key detail is mm -hmm. that I was a medical student at the time. Um, and uh, you, there's no guarantee where you match as a resident physician. And I happened to match at USC. Uh, I think probably the film helped with that, but there was certainly no guarantee. And then once I ended up there, I found myself not only as a filmmaker sort of looking for the next part of the story but also as a, a character kind of like suddenly I was living this world whereas before I was mostly just a observer. That's crazy like for me I watch so many you're in it and I see you so much as you know you're a doctor this is what you do yeah and then you are approaching it and taking on that second title of filmmaker and you do you balance both well did that help get information out of patients? Were they more welcoming to you? Did they understand what you were doing as you were filming them in these critical situations? Uh, yes, and in fact, we had to be careful because you would imagine that, I mean, there's a place of healing. People are gonna trust their physician to be mm -hmm. a doctor. You don't, you don't necessarily gamble on also like being involved in a film at the same time. So I think it was a very sensitive subject for like mm -hmm. my team and I because we mm -hmm. didn't want to ever take advantage of that scenario. Mm -hmm. um, we would always be explaining to patients, like, listen, you know, we're trying to stand up for what we think is a very backward system in America, and we think that you deserve better care. We're trying to make a okay. film about that. You want to work with us? And by and large, I mean, patients were willing to work work with us. I mean, if anything, I, I think I kicked and screamed more about being in my own film uh, at times, just because, like, you know, I, I don't when want... did you not want to be in it? Well, for the whole first two years of production, I mean, like, it was not going to be about um, the new the sort of uh, like myself and my colleagues. Like, like we were going to just sort of keep the story contained mm -hmm. to the old hospital, and then I think narratively we were going, no, there's there's just too much here. There's too much of a story happening right now, because here we are, we're growing up, mm -hmm. um, we're and growing you have up to grow up with here. it. Yeah, we're growing up as doctors, and the story was evolving. And so, uh, yeah, that's kind of how that went down. Okay, so there's a lot of interviews throughout your film where you do talk to your colleagues separately. Was that then added afterwards, like after you've gotten a majority of your footage? When did you start interviewing them? Yeah, in part. So, I mean, we, we designated time to follow the, the characters. And as we, you know, witnessed what life was doing to them in the emergency department, we would then bring them back for an interview and say, all right, mm -hmm. Let's talk about this. What happened? And that's that's one way that in some ways you're you don't really piss off your friends in documentary because the characters are ultimately chosen by the cosmos. I mean, we we had probably about eight or nine of my friends that I thought were were, were good um, to, to to be followed by cameras. They were comfortable mm -hmm. with it, and ultimately only half of those had the cases that we felt were you know co contributing mm -hmm. to the story. And so in the end, it's like I didn't even get to cast my own film in a way. It sort of just happened naturally. 
Okay, and how many hours of footage do you think you shot? I mean, the, the film's 88 minutes. How much? How many hours were you filming throughout these four years? Like, so, you know, it's not many pe I think people want to hear like 20,000 hours. Instead, we, I think we shot maybe like a few hundred, okay. um, which when you, when you learn more about the documentary community, I mean, that's something that's actually valued. It, it, mm -hmm. it probably means you were more focused. I mean, that's not the same for every film, and there's some, certainly times where you just have to roll on everything and you take what you can get, but it, 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 for every hour you add, that's, that's mm -hmm. uh, more of a headache for your editor. You know? When did you find yourself choosing to say, okay, let's film this? Um, was there specific cases you'd hear them about to come in? You're like, we need to film this one. Was it based on the people? Was it based on people who were on staff that day? Yeah, it'd be a mix of things. And I think that for the most part, um, you know, we were interested in telling a story about intensity. What does mm -hmm. intensity mean? And for us, I think intensity meant clarity. I mean, I think that when we were pushed, it meant that we could only really see what we really had to do and nothing mm -hmm. else. And so, you know, intensity for us could be very loud and big and crazy, as some of the scenes that you mentioned mm -hmm. are, or it could be really difficultly intimate, um, like telling someone that their mom just died. Mm -hmm. How are you going to do that? I mean, that's a pretty intense moment. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I think what we look for and the benefit of that scenario is like, OK, how is this how is this helping me? And, and usually the answer was, well, in these moments, you it's really easy to see what matters about healthcare. And then you, you do go through that in healthcare. Every time I feel like you Google like the healthcare system, it's everything always starts with we are in the worst medical crisis we have ever seen. And then it sometimes talks about something else. And like everyone says we're in this huge medical crisis. I feel like your movie does a really good job of trying to get people on the page where they're learning what the questions we need to be asking. And you spread the focus. It's not very, it's not narrowed to like this is the center problem. It's not placing any in my opinion, I didn't get that there was a specific blame. It was that there's all these contributing factors. Yeah. Do you think, how do you propose people change that? Do you have to focus on one thing at a time? Is there a central movement that people can do to cause change? I know that's a really big question. And obviously, you just spent 88 minutes on a film diving into problems that it has. But do you have ideas for solutions or where to start? For, for first of all, be very, be very afraid of syphilis, okay? I mean, that's a very serious medical problem. Okay. Okay, that's my first advice. I will okay? try to stay away from syphilis. Okay, Thank listen. You. I can do my listen, part. Listen, STDs are for real, okay? I know, I'm an ER doctor. Look out. Um, Amongst not. the gunshot wounds and everything yeah, else. Yeah, yeah, for real. It's Look really out for syphilis, syphilis, okay? It's not over yet. Um, there, there isn't, a, I mean, there are, there are some value questions that I think would apply to all Mm -hmm. uh, Americans, and um, I think that's probably the problem with the healthcare debate is that we're at a policy level when maybe we skip the value discussion, and it's, that's, you know, what can you do about that? Uh, it would be naive to say that, like, you know, can, can we just not care about each other's health? Well, in theory, you could not, but then we ultimately all pay for it, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if you have a diabetic um, and they could be getting insulin for, for pennies a day, right? Um, then we could save our society the million dollar ICU stay uh, or their unnecessary surgery that they're going to get in 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty progressive idea to say to people, you know, so we it's should. On, like defensive medicine. Yeah, uh, preventative care, right? I mean, so mm -hmm. these, are, these are values. It's like, well, but before we even get to the idea of how do we do preventative care, it's like, well, look, do you care about your neighbor? Do you, mm -hmm. do you care about them? And, and the economic answer to that would be, well, you should, because if you don't, we all pay for their. Their, their bad health, you mm -hmm. know? Um, I, I don't know if there's necessarily solutions to that other than, you know, what kind of country are we? What kind of, what kind of society are we? Do, is that something that we care about? Is it not? I don't know. So we have to change the mentality, which is obviously a lot harder, but it's also, it's hard because it is a huge scope, but it's basic. What you break it down to is it being basic, caring about your neighbor, making these small steps to avoid, and avoid huge surgeries like you said and then you break it down where in your you're often in code black you've got all these people who are waiting hours and then half of them sometimes go home because they can't wait that long but yeah. being that it's a headache being that it's a cold and they're kind of put on the bottom totem pole and then their cases get worse and then they're they wait until they are at level one level two and then they're coming in and we're spending more money right so it's getting rid of those or helping with the smaller medical cases in a, in in also I guess. Yeah, and I think I mean what you're uh, in part what you're bringing up is the idea that, you know, I mean look, being sick sucks. Um, 
needing needing a doctor at mm -hmm. two in the morning sucks because ideally I think that we would all agree that the ER is not the best place for a lot of healthcare to happen. To be mm -hmm. honest, I mean, you know, uh, most of what we see in the ER should not be in the ER. Although the specialty has changed to accommodate that, and and we do with a smile because at the end of the day, people need to be taken care of, and it's better than nothing. That said, we would all agree. I mean, if you're coming in for your high blood pressure. I'm, as an ER doc, I'm not going to see you again. You, you need someone mm -hmm. who's going to have a relationship with. And so um, these are not things that uh, at our age we really worry about because we don't have these kind of issues, hopefully ever, but definitely not yet. Um, but when you are in that position, you know, you're, I think you're, you're sort of in uh, some tough decisions sometimes. It's like, well, you're going to go, you're going to take a day off work to That's go to the like, doctor. You, there's so much fear around yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Like, personally, like, I do have insurance, and I even get scared about when I need to go to the doctor. If right. I envision myself going to the doctor, it's like, oh, I'm probably going to go if I have a broken bone. Right. Because I don't want to go if I have a cold. I don't want to go if I'm going to, I don't know what I'm going to end up paying for. I have no idea what services are covered and what's not and how many hours I'm willing to spend there. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I might as well just drink a bunch of juice and try to take my Advil and hopefully it will get better. And then I do wait until it's at that point where it's been two, three weeks. And I'm like, oh, now I've had a cold for three weeks. And they're like, why didn't you come in and tell us? But there's a fear. There's a fear surrounding going to the doctor. What is covered? What isn't? How much time? And it gets to critical conditions. And I think that's for everyone. Yeah. A lot of people you talk about are the uninsured or are people who can't afford it. I'm in the luxury where I have had insurance, and I still fear it. I well, still... Well, and it's inconvenient. There's a lot of things that are just not mm -hmm. easy about it. It's not... Yeah. There is a stigma around it that no matter what, you're going to be in a bad position. Like, I don't know anyone who goes to the doctor and is like, oh, it's going to be a half an hour appointment. Right. And that's the hospital. That's your family physician. That's anyone you're expecting to spend two hours. And a lot of that you break down goes to being it. People need now paperwork. You can't just go in and say, like, here, have some vitamin C. It's They are going to have to make a process out of you. True. And it, it's never done simply, even if it is a simple case. So are we, is this now, are we going to take callers now? Is that, do you want to yeah. take callers? I heard we're going to take some callers. Is that right? Do you have a friend who's calling? No, I heard, I heard we're going to take callers. We're going to do some, we're going to do, do some curbside medical diagnoses. Yeah? Well, Anybody I have already? a curbside medical diagnosis. Are we, you talking about my burn? We looked at this earlier. <laughs> yeah. I have a horrible burn from fajitas, guys. And curbside medical attention, I think, is the way of the future, where you just now have to go bombard all the people you know who are doctors and get them to fix you. That looks like lupus to me, to be honest. Is there... Really? Yeah. This, yeah. this little speck right here. Are you, is that your new future, turning into curbside medicine? First you of all, lupus, break... I'm not making fun of lupus. Lupus is like a real, real disease, by the way. I um, don't have lupus. It's a real, it's, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, that's, that's a Can minor Can this be burn. the sequel to that's Code Black? Burn. Yeah. Curbside medicine yeah. at the After <laughs> yeah. studio, at Anatomy of a Movie in the studio. Yeah, and we're going to try to get that a theater run. So Perfect. it's going to be awesome. Yeah. Wait, let's yeah. actually talk about how you did get this into theaters. Let's go back okay. to the movie. Let's go back to Code Black. So premiered last year in festivals, and yes. then this year we are bringing it to the big theaters. How did you get it into the festival run in the first place? Um, how did you go about that? Well, we, uh, we, we first of all uh, tested the hell out of the film. And because I was nervous, it was terrible. Seriously, seriously. I mean, what did you think was terrible about well, it? Well, listen. I mean, the 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 benefit and crutch of the film is that we are so internal to that world. So okay. in some ways, you know, like look, all documentary is subjective. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's such a thing as an objective doc. But you know, in this case, we were pretty damn subjective mm -hmm. because we worked there. So uh, and it's your life. Yes, and it's my life. And uh, yeah, and at that point, I was a resident, training 60, 70, 80 more hours a week plus the demands of, um, you know, cutting a feature film. That's, uh, that's not a, a combo no I sleep. recommend. Um, yeah, and yeah, so, so this is, these, are, these are problematic uh, forces. Nobody sets out to make a bad film, but mm -hmm. let's face it, it happens. And I, I think I was worried that we had uh, a piece of garbage, to be honest, and worse, one that could damage an already... Uh, this is a this is like an institution that's like an mm -hmm. endangered species, like like a, a county hospital is publicly funded. It does not need any more bad press. And so, uh, yeah, I was pretty nervous that I would be the asshole to be graduating from my residency with a horrifically reviewed film about the LA County Hospital and was just going to get uh, booed. And probably. luckily, it got rave reviews. And I think it one did. of the messages that we need more hospitals like County Hospital who are mm -hmm. willing to 
take all of these people. We need more facilities like that. I mean, there's one point in your film where you show a map of all of the places like County Hospital, and they're scattered like crazy. And I was like, I was like, if I lived in the middle of the state and had no insurance, how would I get there? Right. It's so hard. So I don't think they got that message. For all of those of you who haven't watched it, go watch it. Trust me, you'll learn to respect this place. But how did you go about just getting your film into those places that it could be screened, making those contacts, submitting it to festivals? Like, did you know about that world before? You've been training in medicine. How, where yeah, did you no, find all this no, out? No, no. Uh, so happily, uh, I, I had an amazing team. So I brought okay. on uh, some veteran producers. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were they were incredible. So I mean, early on in the process, uh, before we were done filming, even uh, I, you know, I showed an assembly reel to them. I said, "Listen, I think uh, I think there's something here." Uh, they agreed. Uh, slowly but surely, we built a great team. Mm -hmm. And uh, of those team members, we had, we had filmmakers who had made films before and had uh, had experience in the festivals. And so I was very fortunate to not have mm -hmm. to do this by myself. Uh, had a, a ton of support. And um, ultimately, I think that we forged a path that ended up being the right one for the film. I mean, in the moment, you're always wondering, you know, should we have gone for this festival or should we have started here? You know, it's easy to second guess yourself. But in the end, you know, I can't complain. I mean, uh, we, we did uh, a great run at the L.A. Film Festival. Mm -hmm. where we premiered exactly one year ago. And it's back. Yeah, and then we're pretty much ran uh, undefeated at uh, 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 domestic festivals. Did a great uh, run at Vancouver. And Were then, you expecting those awards? Were you expecting to win? Like, how did it feel when you found out it was getting all of these reviews and it was doing so well? Uh, no, I was not expecting it at all. I mean, I think it was uh, it was pretty it was pretty awesome. I mean, you know, I think again, we th if you think about it, just for any film to make it to the screen period takes about a hundred miracles. For it to not suck is probably <laughs> another hundred more miracles. And in this case, uh, that that applied to us. I mean, it, either by accident or skill or otherwise. Uh, you know, I think we, we found ourselves here with a, with a great film. And, and I, I do think the cosmos has a lot to do with it. I mean, mm -hmm. I think there were times where, particularly in documentary, um, we just got lucky. And, you know, I think that there's many ways to screw it up after that, and we got lucky some more. So, I mean, I think that uh, I, I just feel really blessed and lucky about it. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm very motivated to, to keep working. What were, you had all of these screen testings before you went to festivals. Did you make any big changes based on people's reviews or things that they were confused about? No? Kept Not really, yeah. Um, we thought about, we had a lot of requests for it to be in 3D. And we said, listen, <laughs> listen, okay, that is, that is, that is, that is, surprising that is fucking tacky. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. That is tacky. It's okay. That was tacky. But that is really tacky. You know, guy, we don't want to have blood and vomit people in 3D. Don't you think that'd be tacky? Could you handle it? I'm, I'm just really surprised because that's a, that's a notion that never really hit me. Like the most, you have a very big, loud, exciting opening with like helicopters and second pack, but. Listen, all the studios overall, wanted it in 3D and we resisted. We said, no, we will not, we will not I make this film in 3D. I think that was no. a good choice. Yeah, no. So, um, so yeah, once we were out of that, we, we said no 3D films okay. here. Um, and then they were like, we'll make it in IMAX. And I said, again, I'm like, no, we're not going to make this film in IMAX. This mm -hmm. is actually a true story. At, um, I think it was uh, somewhere in the Northwest, either, I think it was Portland. I said, we like, got Portland, you got Seattle. Portland, <laughs> Portland they, I believe it actually screened in IMAX. Like, it wasn't like, it wasn't native to that format, mm -hmm. but it was, it was shown in okay. a real IMAX theater. And to those people, I say, wow. Because <laughs> it is a very, you know, we, we joke that there's like a splash zone in this film, mm -hmm. like the, the first few rows, you know, it's a pretty intense place to be. Mm -hmm. And so I always warn people at the festivals, I'm like, listen, you might want to just, you know, you know, maybe back up or something, because yeah. uh, it's intense. Brace yourself a little bit. It's yeah. talking about real life, the most critical situations you can find yourself in. That's right. So. That's right. And all joking aside, I mean, like, these are obviously very, like, intense and like gruesome mm -hmm. uh, scenes again that we, we are trying to show you uh, you know look at the, it, ultimately if you just you, you mm -hmm. sign up for this industry you want to be you want to be a doctor you want to come into the emergency department um, you know this, this is gonna be the first thing that freaks you out and then the next thing that freaks you out as you know as you've seen the film is not the trauma it is not the shock and awe it's actually the waiting room and it's it's the it's the idea of healthcare access and all the barriers that separate us as doctors and patients and then you go that's really the most scary thing coming out of this do you hope to like encourage the next generation of doctors to keep going? Like, 
do you think that people will see this and be like, oh, we do need more doctors, we need more nurses, we need more people out there and searching for that career? Is that what you want? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the good news and the optimist, I mean, I hope the optimistic message of Code Black is that, you know, like the, the idea of the American physicians changing. I mean, mm -hmm. most of my colleagues have left other industries to do this. Like they, they were either bankers or engineers or something, you know, so they, they've all left uh, other industries because they're like, you know, I, I think I want something, I want to fight for something more which is very different than the notion of being like, I just want to get rich. Uh, not that that happens, uh, by the way. I mean, really, that's a very rare outcome these days in medicine, um, especially since I am $275,000 in loans. Woo! What's that, Maria? Maria, <laughs> plug, plug, no. Yeah, what? so yeah, so, it, so seriously, so that's a problem and, um, but that's also based on, I feel like, is it the same in, for your ER, where a lot of doctors are pay, uh, paid based on service versus salary? Uh, the, well, so, I mean, for the most part, you would have to, I think the only way now to, to make medicine lucrative would be mm. to own your own practice and to have a business. For the most part, if you're working for a hospital, as most ER docs do, or if you're working for... Um, a practice as a as an employee, mm -hmm. um, you know, most likely you will be comfortable. I mean, I'm not saying that that you're going to be poor, mm -hmm. but I mean, I get look, I get two paychecks a month, and one entirely goes to my loans, and the other I have to use for rent and other mm -hmm. things. So, so I, I'm not like scoring here. And again, I, I, my point is that most of us are doing this with it's something with, bigger with that knowledge. We know this, um, and we're trying to like do do good things for 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 other people and to be servants frankly and i think that's a very different uh, mentality than than maybe physicians of a few generations past not that they were bad doctors but i think it's just a, it's a growing trend where people are saying you know what i'm going to leave this other area of my life to go do this mm -hmm. and i totally get the consequence well it's hard. i think that there was for so many times it's like oh if you want to make money be a doctor or a lawyer and now times are changing and with whatever is going on with our health care system, people are afraid that there's not going to be enough money to support the doctors, to support the nurses. There's obviously not enough nurses. So it is trying to reach out to people and say that this is needed. Yeah. This is as important as like when we used to have like, I'm, I'm going to get shot down for everything I'm about to say. But like they said that we need like army people to stand up for people to fight for us. But we really need people to fight for us in the hospitals and to be doctors and to be nurses and to because that's where we're really saving lives. But it's it's a, so hard, it's draining, it takes time, and it is every minute, you can't you can't not pay attention. And that's the thing about this film, it's like, you're, I was so sucked into this film just because I was like, anytime you blink, something can change, because it's crisis. Have you seen Grey's Anatomy? Yes. You ever heard of that show? Yeah, I've what heard of that show. What do you think of it? I think that you walk out of Grey's Anatomy, I like Grey's Anatomy, I think you walk out of Grey's Anatomy going, Oh, I like the relationships between the doctors. You're not really thinking about yeah. the relationships. Let me tell you something. That is exactly how the real world is. Yeah. Exactly. Grey's Anatomy, they got it spot on. Spot on. I'm joking. Totally not serious. No. It's, you think it's, it's just drama between the doctors? Yeah, and well, I mean, I, listen, I, I, obviously it's entertainment, and mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, those th we should have fun with those shows. Um, but, you know, it's like the... The, the the legit reality is that it's kind of it's kind of a lonely it's like a lonely profession seriously I mean like there would be plenty of times where I've seen horrific cases and it's it's so sad and mm -hmm. uh, you know you would love some of the scenes that they have in, in, in that show and others where it's like okay you know, I wish there was this like doctor bar where we all go after and we like talk about what happened and it's like all good and it's like you know, a lot of times you have to go home and, and think about those things on your own. And, you know, um, there isn't, uh, you know, what do you, I don't know, when you're this age, uh, when you're young, when you're a new doc, what do you, what do you, what do you do about that kind of experience? And I don't know if it's necessarily easy at times, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's, it's definitely a factor that, that would be hard to translate to any TV show, to be honest, is like, you know, you, you visually consume, I mean, imagine seeing these images in Code Black every single day, and it's like after a while, I mean, there is, a, there is an effect to that. Do you think that it starts to haunt you more, or do you get kind of numb to it at a certain point? I think it depends on who you are, and I think that's partly what Code Black qu questions is mm -hmm. is what what do, do what do you do about your idealism and and your hopefulness and hopefully what's a positive view on the world when every day you're seeing this really interesting like crossroads of a lot of America's problems, right? And the ER has become a place where you go if you're not just sick. What if you're just homeless? Well, we we just see people who just come because they're homeless. That's it. 
there's nothing else wrong with them. They just have no place to go that night. Um, what do you do when exactly that? what I mean, that's the thing. What do you do? I mean, so I mean, yeah, we have social workers. Yeah, we have, um, you know, a place for them to stay often for the night. But we we also can't become a, uh, a shelter per se. Right. We can't we can't give them every meal. I mean, mm-hmm. there's just there's just no way that would be possible. Same goes for addiction, for psychiatric issues, for uh, people who are just they're just down on their luck. And in effect, you know, when they hit rock bottom, well, in America, you often end up in the ER for whatever reason. So I think that those are incredibly weighty issues to deal with when you're in your late 20s and early 30s. Mm-hmm. And you, you don't have necessarily have the, the tools to, to comprehend all that and process it. And then how do you, how do you go forward in your life? What do you, what do, you do that night? You mm-hmm. drink a little scotch? Do you, do, you, do, you, do you go work out? Do you go party? I mean, do you just not even try to think about it? I mean, but I, what I'm suggesting is that ultimately those things um, can, can equate to a profound loneliness and it's mm-hmm. pretty tough. Do you think that having this film has kind of let you escape that, being that this could be like your outlet to reach out to people and that people can identify you? Yeah, and no, that's, see that's actually a good point. Do? I do think that in, in, in many ways, the artistic nature of this thing has been very helpful um, as far as digesting these incredibly difficult um, moments. I also think there's a, um, it'd be interesting to watch this thing in 20 years because it's, it's now this kind of like time capsule of my mm. friends and I, <laughs> like at this incredibly profound place in our life where we're just becoming responsible physicians. But, um, I mean, I don't know. I think, uh, I still don't think that, uh, there's really, I have a great answer for that yet. Like, mm-hmm. I don't really know like what this does to you, uh, cumulatively, you know, and every day you're seeing these incredibly difficult things and this goes for any, I mean, any, mm-hmm. I think any ER doc knows. Yeah. I mean, I told you a little bit earlier, like I have an uncle's in the ER and for years that was like his life. And then he had to be able to designate certain times and he's now getting married to a traveling nurse who you know, has been playing, was planed into his hospital and you do. And he also does, he'll do, um, his big thing is he does treks. Like he does hikes where uh-huh. he serves as a physician. So they just hike to like base camp of Everest yeah. and he's like the doctor who travels them. But he does, ER surgeons have to make very big choices on where they spend all of their time, but it does work out. I think that there is a very, there's a beauty to it and you can't find it. Do you think you'll stay in the path of ER medicine? Definitely. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And I think happily it, it would be conducive to um, continuing mm-hmm. to, to direct other projects, which is mm-hmm. awesome. Uh, what are you thinking? Any plans? Uh, well, the film itself has been optioned for mm-hmm. uh, narrative series, so we're excited about that. Uh, I mean, I think that's got a long way to go, mm-hmm. and it's like very early development, but right off the bat, that's uh, some good news. Um, I've been directing some commercials, actually, so that's been cool. Commercials for what? Uh, I shot an ad for Fujifilm uh, that's about to come out in a few weeks, so I'm excited about that. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Is it? medical oriented yeah so um uh, we we positioned this ad uh, to be sort of this um very like visual um and like uh industrial representation mm-hmm. of uh, medicine where where doctors and patients are in this in this factory and uh, fujifilm uh which they also make uh, ultrasound products mm-hmm. which in some ways really connect doctors and patients um end up being one of the uh answers for this very regulated industrial um uh, uh, system and so we we actually uh, did this all through dance. We reached out to Erica Sobel, who is a rad choreographer here based mm-hmm. in LA, and found a bunch of modern and ballet dancers in the area as well as New York, and um, brought them together uh, for a pretty impressive piece. You're, be- you're becoming like the head of this niche. I'm going to be a doctor, and I'm going to be a filmmaker, and I'm going to continue and find ways to illustrate this story. That's awesome. Yeah, no, it's cool. So, <laughs> I feel like you've just, you're just like, okay, I did a film, did commercials, now I can do a TV series, let's check everything off. That's big dreams, and I think you're succeeding very well at them. So we have many things to look forward to. Also, this is coming to theaters, guys. Code Black, if you haven't seen it, look it up. It's gonna, um, I know you're playing mostly smaller theaters, but I recommend it to everyone, because it affects everyone. This is a movie for... It's easy. Anyone who ever has to go to the doctor. So, you. And it's filmed very well artistically, has a good message. The way you divided it up, it illustrates a lot of the problems in our medical system and I think is very informative to the general public. At least, I'm not someone who really knows a lot about the healthcare system and I feel more informed and more interested. And we give away a free Vicodin party pack to anybody who comes to the first few nights of the theater. That's what I heard. 
That's that's not us. That's our marketing team. I don't know if that's true. I feel like you're lying. I, no, no, that's obviously it's I have not doctor, heard I wouldn't this. do that. But our, our, we have, you know, that's the studio. Yeah, it's all about the studio. Yeah. Well, Crazy there's a fun fact techniques. for you guys. Are you yeah. excited about that? What? The Vicod Impact? No, that's not for real. Yeah. No, okay, no. I'm really gullible. You can't do these things to me. <laughs> I was like, it's not for real. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's like, I feel like I would have heard about this. I don't think the, I don't think the DEA or the California uh, Medical Board would be okay with that. Yeah, That's probably a good thing. Really bad idea. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming in, Ryan. I look forward to seeing you again on one of your next projects. I'll be right here. You come in. I'll be back. And we'll talk about Maria's book again. And we'll do some laundry back there. It'd be great. Okay. Yeah. It's awesome. Next time we're actually going to see this in the laundry. Wonderful. Thank right, you. Thank you. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the rest of the Anatomy of a Movie staff, we would like to thank you for listening and subscribing to the show. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email or tweet us. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been Anatomy of a Movie. watching Anatomy of a Movie on YouTube. For more on your favorite movies, subscribe to our channel here and be sure to let us know what you think in our comment section below here. Bye.